We said at the end of these days, we wanted to change how we think about church. I, in my conversations with people, most people still think about church as it's a place I go to. And then when I leave that place, I'm done with church for the week. But church is, is a family to belong to. It's not just a place to go to. And one of my prayers for us is that we would be, we would know it and the world outside of here, the people beyond the walls of this place would know that we're a community of faith that, that cares deeply about one another and deeply about the things of God and is devoted to, to sharing that with our community and with our world. Now, today we're going to explore the fifth purpose of a church, the fifth core devotion. And this from Acts chapter 2, this is where we've found these core things that we focused on. I want to read this, and then we're going to be making our way to Luke chapter 15 for our message. But I want to start by revisiting the church in Acts 2. And this is just a description of the church when the church was getting it right. When they were getting, they had traction all over, and things were happening, and they were honoring the Lord, and there were some dramatic things. And I think if it, was, if it once was possible that such a people existed, I believe it's still possible today. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. And that's a key verse for us in this passage. The Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Now, why is it that day by day, People were coming to Christ. People who were spiritually lost were coming into a faith relationship to Christ. Well, there's a magnetism about this church. And you see it in the things that they're devoted to. You see it in their unity. You see it in their generosity. But all those great things that were happening in the church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, if they didn't go outside that church and tell their friends and tell their neighbors about it, it would have been a mystery and no one would have ever known it. They had to leave there and engage their community, engage their city, and then to the ends of the earth. They had to tell the story. And that's what we're fo focusing on today is you have to tell the story. People outside don't know the goodness of Jesus and the goodness of what's taking place inside the church unless we tell them. And that's what we want to engage in today. So I want to talk to you about this fifth core devotion of the church and it's going to your circles of influence, to your relational world, people you already know. And sometimes when we think about sharing our faith or talking to people about Jesus, we, we can find that to, uh, it has to be people I've never met before. I have to go to some person X that's a stranger and cold call them and start trying to talk about Jesus. Now, these are people, you already know these folks. You know their name. You know a lot of their story. They're people that, you're, they're your neighbors, they're your friends. You, you, you stand on a sideline at a ball game or a practice with the, this group of people on a weekly basis, maybe multiple times a week. Th these are the people we're trying to engage and to talk to. So your relational world, people already in your circle, Jesus challenges us in this, and the reason that we talk about this as a core devotion is because it's core to the person and the work of Jesus. This is Jesus' heart, and we want to reflect Jesus' heart in our priorities and how we approach this thing called the Christian life. And so we see Jesus' heart on display as he tells three stories in Luke chapter 15. And if you're familiar with this, it's a story about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and lost son, a wayward son, the prodigal son. We'll spend most of our time with the third of those stories, but we want to visit all three. And to start that, I want to read from Luke chapter 15 and the first 10 verses. Here's what it says. This is from the ministry of Jesus. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, near to Jesus. They were they were attracted. They saw in Jesus something they did not see much of anywhere else. They saw a love and they saw a compassion and they saw, they saw truth and hope in Jesus. 
So they're coming to him. The Pharisees and scribes, they're, they're much more interested in religious tradition than in a relationship to God. And they're grumbling, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Like, yeah, you shouldn't be spending time with people who are far from God, people who are lost. You ought to be with the religious folks like us. And Jesus tended to care a little more about sinners because uh, we're all sinners and need a Savior. So he told them a parable. A parable is a teaching story Jesus used to make an application. Here's what he says. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Verse 8. Or, what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses a coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I've found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, the first story is about a shepherd. And the shepherd loves his sheep. And here's how the translation goes. Again, pay, which of you, and that's a key part of this story, which of you, being a shepherd of a hundred sheep, and loses one of them? Now, we, we don't get the culture side of a lot of things in the Bible. There are things that are said that we can pass over quickly, and this is one of those spots. These three parables are tightly bound around a Middle Eastern culture, a Middle Eastern worldview. And it's a, it's a shame, anti-shame sort of culture. There are a lot of cultures in the world that operate this way and today. And so what Jesus says, which one of you who loses a sheep, his audience sitting around him when he said that, Well, not me. In fact, I don't know anybody who would do that. How would you lose a sheep? I would never lose a sheep. No one I know would ever lose a sheep because that would be a shameful thing to happen. Oh, they, they, might, they might wander off. A predator might, uh, might get one of the sheep, but I would never be so neglectful as to lose a, one of my sheep. When, when he said this, he's talking about a shepherd like no shepherd that that fits in with their world, like no shepherd they've ever heard of before. The shepherd has 100 sheep, and he leaves the 99. He leaves them in open country. He doesn't take them back into the village and put them all in a pen for safekeeping and then go out. He just he leaves the 99, and he goes to find the one lost sheep, and then he does the craziest thing ever. He announces, I lost a sheep, but I found it again. Let's have a celebration. Well, you'd never admit to doing something like that, not publicly. This guy is like no one they've ever met before. Well, that he would lose a sheep, but then that he would let other people know he'd lost a sheep, and then he throws a party to celebrate. Rejoice with me. I found what was lost. Second story. Same hypothetical. Suppose one of you, it says, what woman among you, now he's picking on the girls, what woman among you has a coin, loses a coin, in that culture, no one would have said, oh, yeah, I know how that goes. Well, I'm always losing coins. Oh, no, th th this is crazy. They would have said, I would never lose a coin. That's, I would never admit to losing a coin if, if I did lose a coin. You don't do that. It's too important. None of us would do that. Especially for them, coins are too rare, too valuable. This is a farming culture, an agrarian culture. Uh, it's a barter system. Some people would have coins for exchange and commerce, but very seldom, and most would not. Uh, they, they bartered for everything. This woman, she has coins. Ten coins, uh, silver coins. Scholars believe this represented her dowry, that her dad said, I'm never going to get this girl married off unless I pay somebody to take her. So, I'm going to 
just roll with it. So I'm going to give her these, these, these ten coins. And, and typically what would happen with that, she would, she would make these ten coins into a piece of jewelry that she would wear around her neck everywhere she went. Now why is that? There's not a bank to put this in in your typical village. and Not a bank you could trust in a big city. And she doesn't have a safe that she'd lock it away in at the house. This is a lot of value. And so she carries this with her. Uh, like you'd, you'd wear a money belt uh, if you were traveling internationally or on vacation. You, you, you'd want to keep, keep your stuff with you all the time. Well, this is the idea of this, th- these coins. And it is so very precious. And, and she loses one. So she takes the house apart trying to find it. She scours every, every square inch. She sweeps everything until she finds her coin. And then what does she do? She announces to everybody, I lost my coin, but I found it. And come to my house, we're having a party. Because what was lost has been found. And they would say, that's like nobody I've ever heard from before. I have never known a woman who did something like that. And then Jesus tells the third story. And I'm not going to read all the verses of this story, but I'm going to reference several verses along the way as we work our way through. But I want to tell you the story. And it begins in verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. And you know the story. There's the, the younger son, the prodigal son. And he asked his father to divide the her- inheritance. And so the son then takes his share of the inheritance, and he goes off to a far country, and, and he blows through that money just having a good time and then he hits rock bottom and he thinks maybe I can go home and he goes home and the father welcomes him in a really unusual extravagant sort of way welcomes him home and they live happily ever after if you think with a western mindset that's the that's what you pick up from the prodigal son story but if you see this story you hear this story through middle eastern eyes you're going to hear it and see it a little differently so I want to drop you into that context today the story opens divide your inheritance i want my inheritance now so that i can have my share of the estate and to everyone's amazement the father does this now here's why this is a big deal because what he's just said to his father is i wish you were dead right now because that's when he should receive his inheritance he said i I wish that you were out of the picture because i want my half of everything right now and and amazingly the father does this. And here's how, here's how it reads in verse 13. Not many days later, and that's an important part of this, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Now notice, he didn't leave immediately. He left not long after that. See, the father didn't have the ability to just go down to an ATM and punch in some numbers and he has a stack of bills and the son takes off. There's very little currency that's out there. So his inheritance, it's all wrapped up in property, in things that belong to the family and in the family. And so before the son can leave, he has to liquidate his inheritance. So he has to find a buyer for each item in the inheritance. So dad can give him his portion of the family jewels. Then he has to go and find a neighbor to sell it to or the family land, or the family cattle, or whatever, whatever resources the family has. He has to go, and he can't list this on Craigslist and just hope people will call him. He has to go door to door. So he goes to people who've known him his whole life, and he says to them, I have this, and can I exchange it? Because maybe they do have coins. Can I exchange this for gold, for silver, for something I can carry easily with me? And the people in the village, and these are, not, these are not giant cities. They are small, tight-knit, well-known-to-each-other villages of simple people. And these people knew he is selling what's been in his family for generations. That he's asked for it while his father's still alive. He has insulted his father. He's brought shame on his family. But here's the bigger deal, because we tend to think, well, you know, what's my business is my business. These people don't think like that. They think in terms of the community. And he's brought shame on their community by doing this, by asking for this. He is, he is 
brought a, a disrespect to his culture as a whole. And they, the whole village is feeling this. So, he finds people who will do it. And, uh, and gradually, he transitions all of the property, all of the possessions, and the city, the little village has a contempt for him. And he realizes, I can't stay here in this village. They're going to hate me forever. I'm going to have to go somewhere else. So he goes to a faraway country. It appears he goes to a Gentile country as well. He leaves as soon as he sold the last of his possessions. And by now, the villagers are probably open, openly antagonistic toward him, uh, tangibly shunning him, shaming him, seeking to show him the same level of disrespect and disregard that he has shown to his family, his father, and to his village. And he takes off to the far country. And in the far country, he begins this descent, self-destructive behavior. It takes him down a, down a terrible path. The text says in verse 13, there he squandered his property in reckless living. Here's the part. He, he wasted it, and he did it in front of the citizens of the faraway country, they're probably a Gentile community based on some things we'll, we'll find in just a moment, but they still have a Middle Eastern mindset. And they have very little use for this uh, foolish young man who's now out of money. The polite way, again, this is a cultural thing, the polite way for a Middle Easterner to get rid of an unwanted nobody would not be to say, you need to leave. They, they wouldn't do it that way. They would ask him to do something he couldn't do. They would ask, assign him a task that he would have to refuse, and it's a backdoor way of getting rid of a problem. So when the son asks for a job, because he's, he's used up his resources, one of the students makes him an offer. Sure, I need somebody to take care of my pigs. And it's a job they didn't think he could possibly accept because they knew he was from a Jewish background. Law of Moses said, you can't uh, care for pigs. It's an unclean animal. And... They'd have to be fed seven days a week, and that would mean that he couldn't keep the Sabbath. But to everyone's surprise, he is so low, and he's, he's so distanced from everything that's been valuable to him and to his family for years, he, he accepts the job. And it's a terrible job, and it doesn't pay well enough to keep hunger away. Now, in this hole of self-pity, as he, he, he's hit rock bottom, he finally has a moment of clarity in thought. And he realizes, this is crazy. I, I wonder if there's any hope that I could go home. But I know I can't do it as a son. I can't go back and say, Dad, I want my place back. I want to be your son again. But maybe, maybe I could go back and be a servant. Maybe I could, my, my, my dad's hired hands are better off than I am right now. Maybe he would let me come back in that capacity. Because I know I've insulted and shamed my father. I'm a failure. I have nothing to offer my family. The Middle Eastern sons are supposed to provide for their fathers, not, to, not live off of them. But now he begins to think creatively. Maybe if I ask to be a servant, he devises this plan. Maybe if I admit I was a fool, I can at least be a, a hired hand in a familiar place. Now, there are two problems with this plan. The first plan, uh, first problem is, will his father really accept him back after he is, all this has been done in public, in the community that he lives in, that he's from, that he grew up in. He's publicly humiliated and insulted, shamed his father. Will his father take him back? Here's the second thing. What about the village? Will they receive him back? He had disgraced them all by the shameful behavior. You add to the fact that he lost all his money, all this resource, to a Gentile population, and the prodigal has, has no solution for pleasing the, vi the villagers. Th there's no way to win them back, and so he recognizes that when I go back, and this is the, through the Middle Eastern eyes, he recognizes when I go back, dad may or may not accept me, but there's not a chance this village is going to accept me. So, I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to do this walk of shame back to dad's house. This is, often when we think about the, the story of the prodigal son, it's the father was sitting 
in a lawn chair or on his front porch looking down a long driveway in the open country and the prodigal son comes walking down the long driveway and he sees him at the end of the driveway and runs down to meet him. But that's not how cities were arranged in the first century, part of the world Jesus is teaching in. They were communities packed in close together. They did their farming, they did their, their livestock and all that on the, away. To get to his father's house, he was going to have to walk right through the middle of a lot of people and other houses, people who knew him and knew his story and, and knew his rebellion. How's he going to beat that? He says, there's no way. But maybe, maybe at my father's house. So to his father's house he goes. And this is where the father comes into the story in full force. The father, because of his experience, knows a couple of things. He knows, first of all, his son's going to crash and burn at some point, and there's a pretty good chance he may come, try to come home. Second thing the father knows is that the people of the village are not going to treat him well. Everyone would know what was right and wrong culturally. They all played by the same rules. They would know this son deserves nothing short, really, of death. He knows that if the son ever does return, word's going to get out, this crowd is going to gather, and they're going to, uh, they're going to attack him verbally, maybe physically. They will mock him, spit on him. He knows that the son, in order to get home, is going to have to, going to, have to experience the scorn of the crowd every step he takes through the village. The father knows this. And everything he does next is in response to what he knows the village will do. And he does five things. And by the way, these things are outrageous things for Middle Eastern culture. Every, the five things that he's about to do, they say, just like they said, I have never heard of a shepherd like that. I have never heard of a woman like that. I have never heard of a father like this father. So again, his, Jesus is sitting, telling this story. His listeners gathered around him. And here's the first thing he says the father does. And they know what should happen. They, they have an expectation of how the story is going to go. And Jesus says, the first thing the father does is he runs. When word came to him that his son has been seen, he's coming into the village. He's on the outskirts of the village. The father runs to him. Instead of, instead of letting the son walk the gauntlet of the village, the father runs the gauntlet himself. Now, and it was an outrageous thing to do because Middle Eastern noblemen with flowing robes just don't run. To do that, he'd have to pick up that robe, or he'd be tripping over it, pick up that robe, which exposes his, his feet, his ankles, his legs to public view, which is something you just didn't do. It was a disgraceful thing. It was a, a crazy thing, a foolish thing. But the father lifts up those robes, and he runs toward the son. Now, the villagers, the villagers would have considered him, you're humiliating yourself. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, said, great men never run in public. That's why I gave up jogging, because I would have done it. But, you know, if Aristotle said, here's the thing about Aristotle, though. He didn't know Jesus, so there's a lot of things about Aristotle not quite right. Here's what the father does. Jesus explains why. But while he was still, this is verse 20, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Here's what, here's what we need to sure enough understand about our father in heaven, because the father in the story is an illustration of our father in heaven. Our father in heaven feels a compassion for his children and for his lost children. In our, not, not because we cleaned up our act, but still in our lostness and our sinfulness, whether we have run from God, rebelled openly and freely like the prodigal against, against Father, whether we have drifted, fallen. God loves His children, and He is motivated by love for His wayward children. So the father runs through the village, and he knows he's creating a spectacle. He knows how crazy this is to his neighbors. He knows they will talk about this, tell this story. Read, did, you'll never believe what I saw yesterday. 
for, they'll tell it for years, the humiliation of this father. But this father, he doesn't care because he cares more about his son than he does his own reputation. And now, imagine for just a moment the son's view of this story. He knows to get to his father, he has to go through the town. He knows what he's going to endure. He knows what the people are going to do. Spit a fit on him, mock him, criticize him, to possibly attack him, throw things at him. But if he's going to get to the father to be his servant, he has to go through the village. And he braces himself for what's coming next. And he expects to see angry faces and jeers and attacks. And what does he see? All that is on the edges because everybody right now is not, eyes aren't on him. They're on the father. Robe up, feet, ankles, legs showing, and he's running. And everything's shutting down for this show. This is the craziest thing they have ever seen, ever, ever could have imagined as the father makes his way. And that's what the son sees. This is all because of the love of the father. The words can't express what the scene really conveys. The father runs. Second thing, the father, this is what the father does next. He kisses his son. It says in verse 20, he ran and embraced him and kissed him and and the word for kissed him is a, a verb tense that means over and over. And over. This wasn't like the polite, oh, you know, you know both, both cheek sort of thing. He embraced him, and it is shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye, face to face. He is hanging on to the sun. And that process continues according to how the words Jesus used to describe this encounter. You know, the son, he pictured in his mind how this reunion would work how he would humble himself. He had rehearsed this scene over and over and over again. And, and what he would need to do is he would, he would approach the father. He'd kiss the father's hand. He'd drop down on all fours, and he would kiss the father's feet because what he's asking for, he's asking to be a servant in the father's house, and that would demonstrate all the things that would be necessary if his father would allow this at all. But his father won't let him go through with his plan. He has him wrapped up. And he kisses him and kisses him and hugs him and hugs him. And the son can't bend down to carry out what is necessary on this request. Now, back in the faraway land, the son planned his reunion speech for his father. In verse 19, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And, okay, I'm going to admit my guilt. I'm going to ask to become a servant and hope for the best. Now, that's his planned speech. Here's his actual speech when the father has him wrapped up and showering with kisses. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And that's where the verse stops. Because he couldn't carry out. And, and I'm just wondering if maybe you have a spot among me, uh, among your hired servants, for a guy like me. The request for servant is missing. Why is it missing? Because he can't carry out the plan. He can't kneel because his father's arms have him wrapped up. He can't get to the ground to kiss his father's feet. His plan, I'm going to try to earn my way back into my father's favor. Maybe, may, maybe there'll be some hope for me. Maybe there'll be something at this, at this household for me. N not to be called a son even, but at least a life and an identity again with people who have known me and who at some level still care about me. But there's no owning, no, no, no earning your way back into the Father's favor because the Father just accepted him right then the way he was. And how could he do that? The third thing the Father does is call for a robe to put on his son. This is from uh, verse 22. But the father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Question, who owned the best robe in the family? The father. Yeah, the father would have owned the best robe. And this is a culture, and again, in the first century, it's not like I have this closet full of all these different outfits that I can strap on. Most people, if they had something to change into while they were washing the, the other uh, set of clothes, they're pretty happy about it. Uh, this is a nobleman. He has servants. He has resources. And so it's possible he may have had a few more than that, but not a whole lot more than a couple of things to wear. So 
when he pulled out his best, again, small village. Everybody in the village would have known that's, that belongs to him, not to the son, and it's his best. That's, that's the wedding clothes. That's the celebration clothes. That's the special, the special occasion clothes. And he's put it on that son. So the father's there on the edge of the village, and the father wants the whole village to know, I've accepted, I've accepted this son back into my home. And he sends his servants to get his best, and the son wears this as they walk through the village, and it's a visible sign to the village, I'm all good with my son. The fourth thing the father does is call for a ring and sandals. In verse 22, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. The ring is, uh, the, the word used indicates probably a signet ring. It's uh, the ring the father would use to conduct business. It's the way he signs official documents, the way he identifies this is, this, is a, this is good with me. We've made a deal here. And what he's saying when he puts this on the son's fingers, I trust him. And he has, he has full authority within my family again. And then shoes on his feet. He has sandals on his feet. The reason? Slaves, servants didn't have shoes. It was one of the ways you identified slaves and servants. This young man, he's lost everything. He doesn't have that. Shoes on his feet because he is a free man. He is my son. The fifth thing the father says, and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. Okay, fatted calf. He had plenty of choices. Why not the fatted sheep? Why not the fatted goat? Why not the fatted chicken? Well, because the fatted calf would be enough to feed the village. Because this party is not just for me and my son. I want the village to come to welcome my son home. Now, he doesn't want the son just to be reconciled to him. The father also wants him to be reconciled to the village. He wants everyone to have a relationship with the son. When the son is found, the father throws a party to celebrate his return because he is joyful. So Jesus tells these three stories, and in each one, something goes missing. And three things I want to mention about that. The first one is everything that's missing in these stories, it matters. The sheep matters to the shepherd, the coin matters to the woman, and the son matters to the father. And in each case, what's missing matters so much that it, it warrants an intentional, intense search. And the third thing is that recovery brings rejoicing. In each case, what was lost is searched for and reclaimed. And the shepherd and the woman and the father all throw parties because they are so joy-filled that what was lost has been found. What, was, what they thought was gone is restored. And this is what Jesus is telling us. He's saying, missing things matter to the heart of God. That our Father's heart is, he loves, he loves people who already love Him. But the thing He's trying to tell, what Jesus is trying to tell His audience that's criticizing, that don't understand the Father's heart, the Father's heart is for that which is lost. It's for those who are still far from Him, who are distanced from Him, separated from Him. He wants everybody to know him and everybody to come back to him, everybody to return to him, everybody to know him and have a relationship with him. Find everyone who's missing and bring them to me. And why would you, why would you be motivated to do that? Because of, I'm, I'm, I'm motivated by the compassion I've experienced from God. I, I look at my own life and I see all the things God has done for me and how, how patient and kind and forgiving and long-suffering he is and how welcoming he is to me and I think why, why would I not want to tell somebody else about that why, why would I not want others to know him like I know him I, I so desperately would would want people who are separated from him to experience what I've experienced because my experience is real and, and if you don't have some of that going on in your life you need to go back and revisit I think the relationship to God in the first place because this is a part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We've experienced firsthand lost and found and undeserved love and acceptance and forgiveness and, and that just compels us. 
Because the love of God would be experienced to bring the people who are lost, who are missing, who are separated from Him to Him. We've had challenges each week. If, if something we could do, something tangible to act on these five core devotions. And so I want to give you three options on responding to this week's challenge. And, and you may, depending on your intensity, depending on your spiritual maturity and where you are in your spiritual journey, you may want to take on one of these, take on all three of these. Here's the first option is maybe to pray this simple prayer for the next eight days. You can start today, you finish next Sunday, that's eight days that you would pray this prayer. And it, it's really simple and short. It just says, God, give me your heart for the lost. Give me your heart for people who are spiritually lost. And just pray that every day. Because a lot of the reason why we don't share our faith is because we're really not tuned into God's heart. And so maybe first thing, just to ask God to give us his heart for the for people who are spiritually lost, people who are separate from Him, who need to know Him, people who know about Him, but they don't have a relationship to Him. God, give me your heart for the lost. Now, that's a powerful prayer, and when I pray that prayer, it tunes me in in a different way to every conversation that I have in the course of a day. Second thing, next week we're going to start a brand new sermon series, Greater Than. And well, people are feeling so, so much heaviness because of the, I think the election process is driving a lot of it. A lot of fear and a lot of struggle. The Greater Than series just says no matter what you, what you feel, what you fear, what you're facing in life today, God's just always going to be greater than that. And we're going to pick that apart. So you're going to have opportunity to interact with people in your circles of influence, in your relational world this week, and they're going to say, man, I'm really struggling with this. I'm really afraid. The election gives you plenty of opportunity to get into this conversation. Next week, we're going to talk about some of the things connected to the election as a part of the kicking off the Greater Than series. And say, so why don't you come to church, invite somebody to church, or we're doing something in our, in our group, in our Bible fellowship group, and maybe it's a fellowship, or maybe it's a Bible study, maybe it's Sunday morning, maybe it's a Tuesday night, but invite someone, when, you, when you're in a conversation, use that opportunity to invite them to come, invite them to come to church. The sermon series gives you a good reason, it's a supportive, encouraging, kind of help you move forward and get you unstuck kind of series, so it'll fit for a lot of things with invitation. Third option. Share your faith with somebody. Have a spiritual conversation. And a lot of people have never done this. In your reading this week in the devotional book, there was a way to do a bridge, bridge illustration of here's how you enter into a relationship to Christ. There are a lot of different ways to explain. This is how you enter into a relationship with Christ. And you ought to always have a clear enough understanding to be able to explain to someone else, here's how. If you don't have a relationship to God right now, you could begin a relationship to God through Jesus Christ. So you ought to have a, something in your tool belt to know how to do that. But I, I just want to challenge you, when you're, when you're at work and someone says, when you're standing on the side of a field at a practice or a game, your kid's game, and something comes up in a conversation, when you're with some neighbors, wherever you are in your circles of influence, and this conversation comes up and someone says, this is a tough week for me because, and people say that kind of stuff all the time, they'll throw out, then you can probably tra draw a line and say, I went through something like that. And here's how God, you know, God really helped me at a time just like that a few years back. And I don't have it all figured out, but I sure was glad I didn't have to do it by myself. Uh, maybe he could help you too. And, and that may be all that conversation is. Another step you might take in, in this round is when someone says, I, my marriage is in a real tailspin right now. Uh, there's, there's some crisis in relationship to my kids. There's some health stuff. There's a job crisis. People bring things up all the time. And, and how about this? You throw this one down. This may freak people out, but that's okay. People need a little freaking out every once in a while over something that's good and godly. To say, when they, when, they, when they lay out, here's the need, say, man, that is tough. And, you know, I really believe in the power of prayer, and it's meant a lot to me. And would it be okay if I just prayed for you about that? Most adults have never had another adult pray for them out loud. Man, it's powerful when it happens. And it, it'll soften a hard heart. And just pray, and not, not catch up on your quiet time kind of prayer with them. 
give, give them something t- bite size, but just say, hey, can I pray for you? God, I pray that this relationship, you, you, you just work all the details of that and make it better. Amen. And there's power when you pray for somebody. Maybe it, it, it is just telling your story of how you came to, to give your life to Jesus. But get into a spiritual conversation with someone this week. So, simple prayer, God, just give me your heart for the lost. Help me to tune in because I'm really not tuned into it. Uh, hey, we, I'd love to have you come. Our group is doing this. Uh, come to ch- ch- service this Sunday because our pastor's talking about something that really relates to what you're struggling with right now. Or here's my story and here's how Jesus is working in me. Could I pray for you in a need in your life? But to do something tangible, to reach out to people who, who need to be reached with the good news of Jesus. And you can do this. I had an opportunity last week, captive audience uh, had to, uh, I had the opportunity to get my car fixed because somebody ran over me. And uh, so I got a rental car. And then I had a young guy who climbed in a car with me to take me to get my rental car. And it was amazing. Just asking a couple of questions, pretty soon all sorts of things started to open up in his young life. About his background, about his dad who uh, used to be a pastor and now he's doing some supply preaching things, not a pastor right now, and how uh, he's moved to Dallas and he's not going to church anywhere. And it just opens up. Those conversations are everywhere all the time. And it's just a matter of just a gentle nudge against the door to see what God might be up to. And sometimes the door just flies open and sometimes not so much. But you just push against the door and you see what God's up to and You never know. There's an adventure to the Christian life when you start reaching out beyond yourself. We can do this, and we need to do this. There's a world that needs Jesus out there.